I want to welcome everybody back. I'm Jonathan Kulik from the Swift Certain Fair Resource Center. And uh, as Angela said, we have an esteemed panel of practitioners with us to relate their various experiences. Uh, what we don't have on the title slide there are uh, Judge Portman and Mr. Greenlees from uh, Cook County, ARI Hope Court. Uh, and so we're uh, very pleased to have them here to share the local experiences, which we at the center are quite interested in learning more about. I'll just say that um, because this is being webcasted, we'll ask that uh, you hold your questions until uh, after all the panelists have spoken, because we'll want you to come to one of the microphones at the uh, two front corners so the, the folks out there on the web can hear your questions as well. Uh, so, uh, without further ado, I'll introduce Judge Jackie Portman from uh, Cook County Air I Hope Court to uh, tell us about what's going on locally. Good afternoon. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Judge Jackie Marie Portman, and I am the judge for ARI Hope in Cook County. I have been the judge since the inception of ARI Hope. Um, one of the major challenges I want to say we had off the bat was that we really didn't have a planning budget. We were told about this wonderful program in, Ho in Hawaii, and we watched the videos on the computers, and they said, implement it now, begin. And unfortunately, we didn't have a lot of um, foresight into um, what needed to be implemented to have such a big undertaking. Fortunately for us, on our shoestring budget, we were able to pool a lot of resources that were already into existence together to begin a process. Subsequently, we had a uh, meeting where we started to, it was backwards, of course, we went back and made a planning um, a strategy that we've subsequently implemented, but a lot of it was based on the people who came and the foresight of the individuals that were involved in ARI HOPE. In our jurisdiction, I have a team meeting every single day that we have the court call. We go over every single case, every single day, and the group that is included in this planning and, and the going over of the cases is myself, the state attorney, the public defender, all of the probation officers that are involved, and any treatment um, facility providers who can attend or who may have a big interest in the cases for that day. They all give me um, monthly reports or an up-to-date report on each individual that is in front of me. And then as a team, we discuss strategies and planning on what is best to do in regards to each individual client. Um, just like the HOPE model, on the first day, I have a big meeting with all of the individuals that are coming into HOPE, where I take approximately 30 to 45 minutes, where I literally have a what I call the come to Jesus talk with them, and I explain to them the structure of ARI hope and what they can and cannot do and what the consequences are. So I explain to them with no uh, specific terms the swift and the certainness of ARI. And I even give them examples of what the sanctions will be depending on what some of the violations could possibly stem from, and that comes from the, the collective team approach that we use and implement every single day. Um, as far as the fairness, it's amazing how great the team comes together when trying to work towards the greater goal of figuring out what is best for each individual person. And I agree, you cannot treat everyone exactly the same because they all come with their own challenges. They all come with their own backgrounds. So as a collective team, we all sit down and I enjoy having the conversations with the entire team because everyone brings a different perspective into the team meeting. The public defender has his own opinion and, and his zealousness in fighting for his clients. The probation officers typically just state the facts and what's going on. And then we have the treatment providers who come in and share with us other things that does not necessarily come out during our court hearings. And that collective coming together and bringing together allows us to strategically make a life plan for the individuals that are in front of us. The biggest thing that I know that they always tell me is they love how consistent I am. In fact, sometimes I am in court and someone will do something and the gallery will start shouting out what the penalty is because everyone knows what's going to happen if you do certain things. 
Um, I always get, a, 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 that always brings a smile to my face, needless to say, because it hits me how consistent I can be. And the words that I use and the um, slogans that I use, they can repeat them back to me. And in fact, they do repeat them back to me because it's so consistent. One of the biggest things that I like to hear a lot from them, because I spend a lot of time speaking to them, because I want their point of view as well, uh, how the program is doing, they all join in and say, they know that when they violate, that there is a penalty. And they understand, they are beginning to understand the concept new under ARI Hope, and that is because the time that we put into it, the time that I put into it, the time that the public defender reiterates, the probation officer reiterates, you know, they, they understand that concept. And although they hate being in violation and, and getting punished for the same, they like the consistency and the fairness of it all. Um, we have a nice sliding scale of sanctions that we use. In addition to the sanctions that we use, we also have some wonderful incentives. We give out gift cards. We have um, uh, longer reporting court dates, longer reporting dates to the probation officers, longer reporting in between drops. We have random drops as well in Cook County's jurisdiction. We have what we call the gift box. You know, at certain times of the year, we'll gather, like for the winter months, we'll get hats and scarves and coats. And on certain days, if you are uh, what I like to call on rock star status, you then are able to select a gift from this box, depending on whatever your specific needs are. And all of these things come from the team. The team donates a lot of the, uh, the items that are in the box. We have a new sanction that we've started using called Jury Box, because we have some individuals who can't do the swap, and we have some people who cannot do the community service. So we call some, something that's called Jury Box. They come to court on certain days that they've previously set up, and they actually sit and observe different court calls and different judges. Um, they sign in when they come into the building and then they sign out when they leave from the building and the probation officer goes back periodically and checks on them. So we found that, you know, there are certain sanctions, you know, a community service is great, the swap is great, but sometimes you have some clients who cannot do either of those. So we needed to come up with something that was in between that and that worked out very um, effectively uh, for the Cook County jurisdiction. Um, I, I, would re I would be remiss if I didn't say I... I Love the motto of Air I Hope because, as I tell them, it allows you to take care of you. As long as you are taking care of you, we will never have a problem. And as I explain to them that they are the common denominator on what the court gets to do to them. If you do nothing but good things, you will get nothing but good reports. We are their bigger supporters. You know, we don't have the typical state attorney in our courtroom. You know, she, you know, she's, she's a, a lot of times giving in and, and, and giving them chances. And I, and I stress the importance of second and third chances because we all make mistakes, myself included. My team um, that, that implement AIR, I hope, they don't put themselves above anybody. You know, we try to fit in as best we can. We go out to different or events. We had a client who was in a band, and the team got together, and we went out and paid, paid the tickets and actually went to the performance and saw him performing. Now, halfway through the performance, I have to tell you, he made this big announcement, my judge is here, my judge is here, you won't believe it. And we were all sitting there like, really? And she's right there, she's sitting right there. And so, you know, that you have those moments um, where I didn't necessarily want it to be pointed out, but it made me feel good that he felt good enough to be an individual on probation that he would point out a judge to all of these people that were there. I've gone to funeral services. I've gone to sporting events. Um, the team and I, Mr. Greenlease, he's my uh, he's my run he's my running buddy uh, in regards to air. I hope he tags along to a lot of things with me, just so that we don't have any issues with improprieties or conversations that could possibly take place out of the sight of counsels being there. But in the beginning, I take the time to explain that to the client. You know, there are certain things when you see me, we can't discuss, we cannot talk about. If I see you in public, it's not that I don't want to recognize you. It's just that there's it looks bad if I'm seen talking to you and you are in front of me. So other than a hi or a goodbye. Um, don't get offended. So we, we spend a lot of time communicating, and that's the one thing that I think has gotten lost in the translation with a lot of uh, youthful and older offenders. You know, no one talks to them. No, one's, no one listens to them. And I take the time and my team takes the time to listen. When they come back in front of us, I remember they have four kids or a cat or a dog or a pet tarantula or whatever it is that they have, and you can see the, the joy in their face that, 
not only did someone remember, but their judge remembered. And they have not encountered a judge of this kind um, uh, in, in their life at that point. And not someone that, I, it, it's amazing when I hear them say, you know, they consider me their friend, their family member, you know, they, they look up to me. And it, it's a huge responsibility. Um, it, it, it's a huge responsibility to make sure that I'm always standing upright, but yet remaining humble because of the people that I serve. You know, I, I will quite honestly go to their neighborhoods and look around and see what's going on. I'm just not the judge sitting on the bench. I'm not. I go out into the communities. And when I come back to court, I'll tell them, hey, I was over there. I was over there on that block the other day. Or if they work at a certain job, Mr. Greenlee and I will get together and we'll stop by. We'll do a pop-up visit at their job, which is always hilarious, you know, because, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a public place. But then, as always, before I leave there, oh, that's my judge. Everyone knows that I'm their judge before, before I leave the facility. And I think that ARI Hope works, swift, certain, and fair works. And I also think that part of the fairness is making sure that we give them their accolades, that we tell them when they're doing a good job, when we give them the pats on the back, when we give them the incentives to do better, when we allow them to be a part um, of mentoring pro programs and, and partnerships with other communities, because that's helping them to build a bridge back into the community in which they live. So now they're not just feeling like there's some alien out there walking around, they are now productive they are, all, they are now helping and they are now leaning, leading others onto the right paths. So that's a little um, light into ARI Hope uh, in Cook County. Um, it, has been a, it has been a wonderful transition and there is no greater feeling for me than seeing someone on their very first day in violation walk in front of me and then having them turn from their probation. Like other jurisdictions, I have what we call early term from probation as well. We do a big graduation ceremony where I actually hum the pump, the pump and circumstances as they come up, as we announce their names. Um, it's, a, it's a big to do uh, and, and nothing brings me more satisfaction because I see the transition from day one until the date in which they are terming. And I give them the incentive to get there because I put them initially on what's called rock star status. That means if you go from this court date to the next court date without a single violation, you will elevate to become a full-blown rock star. Once you're a rock star, you have one more court date, and as long as you are in full compliance with the terms and conditions of your probation, I will terminate you early that day, and quite often I will sing the graduation song. And the funniest thing, and I'm done after this, there are days when I have to take off. I rarely take off work because it, this, this means so much to me. You know, it's not, again, it's not just a job for me. It means a lot to see people transform into who they can possibly be. So I rarely take a day off, but on the rare occasion when I do, and it gets out that I'm off that day, they will come in and say, no judge, can you change my court date to the next week when you're here or the next day when you're here? They literally come in, so now I can't even tell them if I'm taking off because no one will want to come to court on the day when one of my partners may possibly be covering me. And that's, that's I, I contribute that to the wonderful working relationship that I have with them. Do I lock people up? Yes, I do. But they understand that. They understand the concept. They come in knowing that that's, that is the penalty because there are certain things that that's the penalty that we give. And it's moving to see that although I have to lock them up, they don't get upset by it. They come in and say, well, judge, I know you're finna lock me up. I shouldn't have done it. I know I made a mistake. I'm just ready to get locked up and get back out and start all over again. And that's what we do. I don't hold it over their head. I don't hold it against them. I'm like, okay, you did your time. We're done with that violation. Now we're moving forward. And you can still attain rock star status. So that's ARI Cook in a nutshell. Um, we work with some very wonderful partners through, through Cook County and the Illinois ICGIA and, and with all of you. So we look forward to hearing all the other wonderful ideas so we can implement them as well. Um, I'm, uh, my name is John Greenlees. I've been uh, judge, uh, the public defender assigned to Judge Portman's courtroom since 2012. Um, I actually applied for and sought the grant position that the office was posting for this slot. I've been a criminal defense attorney going on 30 years. I did death penalty cases for a long time. I've done pretty much everything in the system. And I thought that this uh, 
program that was uh, based on Judge Alm's uh, hope at that point it was kind of an early thing was a really great idea for violators. Our program was set up initially, uh, we were referred people who were in violation of their regular felony probation. So you got referred to this program because you were in violation of your felony probation and a violation was about to be filed by the state's attorney's office in the trial courtroom in front of the trial judge who'd then have the full range of, of possibilities. Um, the way this program was set up, the defendants were, the clients were sent to us with, in, with these violations holding over their heads and the way, as Judge Portman explained, her speech and her procedures, um, they come in as a group. Um, we do speeches, it's been varied over the, over the years, how many we had a month, how, whether it was once a month, two or three times a month. And they're all, it's explained to them that you're in violation. Judge Portman is, is very graphic about, here's what I could do to you, here's the range of possibilities. You pled guilty for probation, these are what could happen to you. And then she explains to them, we're not gonna do that today. We're gonna hold off on this and we're gonna see how you perform because this is a different system. One of the biggest challenges that I've had and I think most defense counsel have in running these kind of programs or, or helping running these kind of programs is convincing the clients, look, this is different. You need to treat this differently. One of the big problems as, as was discussed uh, in Cook County as was found in other jurisdictions the violation system for probation violations is seen as a game. Um, and just like the criminal justice system is a, to a lot of people seen as a game for this kind of criminalistic way of looking at the system. It's just a game, I gotta try to not get caught. If I get caught, we gotta play this game so I can try to avoid the sanction. Uh, but I don't really take it seriously, it's for suckers. These rules and these things that all the rest of you follow are all just a joke. Um, and it's something you're all doing to us, as opposed to, no, it's not something we're doing to you, it's something that, <laughs> that it, the, the society needs to have accomplished. And if you would just work with us, we could get you out of this system and help you get a job and help you stop this revolving door problem that we have with the criminal justice system. Um, it's very hard to convince people that if you want, and just to use an example, somebody who comes in and they're, uh, we use instant cups in order to quickly get a quick assessment, number one, to monitor people regularly for drug use and to get a quick assessment of what's going on so that we can move quickly. One of my jobs is to then go and talk to the person about, all right, your test was hot. Here's what it was hot for. We gotta talk about this. This is an issue, it may be the third time, the first time, the fifth time, whatever it is. Maybe somebody who we've now seen, even though we try not to take people with serious addiction problems because the HOPE model, it's an issue to apply that with a lot of fidelity to drug addicts. Um, people who are in serious addiction, I should say. Um, the, depending on the situation, obviously the, the discussion changes, but one of the things, one of the challenges for, for me is to get across to people that look, yes, you, so you know how this went before. Uh, they, got a, they got a cup, they have an instant test. Um, yeah, we could say, well, that's not really reliable. We want to have a lab test done. Um, that is something we could do. If we do that, we're going to come back in two weeks. That test is positive on the lab test. That's going to be an issue. The issue is now going to be, look, you're trying to play a game with us. We, you know, look, you're trying to deny what's obvious. You're trying, we're trying to help you. Um, so it's a challenge to convince people that, yes, you could avoid the sanction today by doing that. But if, it's a, if you, all you're doing is, is delaying the sanction, that's not helpful. If, we need a, if there's a delay we need for some other purpose, then we can discuss that and we'll go to Judge Portman and talk about, listen, we've got a program set up, we've got some things going on, let us go do this, we'll be back tomorrow. That's all fine, but just to come and play the game. It's the same thing with people who run, uh, who disappear on us, and we have it happen. Uh, as much as we try to work with people to understand, look, you're gonna get your sanction, as, as the original speaker said, if you take off on us and you disappear, when we get you, and we're gonna get you, we're gonna take that as the behavior that it is, and we're not gonna sanction you anymore for the drug, for the hot drug test. We were concerned about that, we wanna help you with that. 
Now we're going to sanction you because you took off, because you ran, because you did what a criminal does. You didn't do what a responsible citizen does. You didn't do what somebody who wants to get off their probation does. Um, that sometimes takes a little while to get through to people. Uh, Judge Portman didn't mention this, but one of the things that our program has that helps us function very well from the swift and certain aspect is a warrant team that does nothing but execute our warrants. And we have to, we issue a fair amount of them. Um, generally, these people are known to us and the warrant team and everybody else. They don't go anywhere. And within a couple days, the warrant team will get them. Sometimes it's a week, sometimes it's longer, but, and bring them back. And so usually, number one, they see that happening to other people and they uh, have it happen to them once or twice and they, it starts to get across to them that, okay, I did wrong, I got a problem. I got to show up for my sanction because it's not going to, it's going to be much less. It's going to be a sanction. It's going to be a small sanction. We're then going to deal with what the pro, what the underlying problem is. But if you take off on us, you're going to have problems. Uh, and as Judge Porter also indicated, we have a, a range of things that will, that kind of behavior will earn you a GPS monitor for a period of time. Uh, it might earn you curfews. It might earn you a home confinement situation with a ban, with electronic ban monitoring that. Um, a lot of what we do is designed to try to get people to be responsible for things. So a lot of the violations are you miss a therapy session. As, and as Judge Porter indicated, we have some very good therapy partners that run uh, cognitive behavioral therapy for me for us and trauma groups. Um, and they're very good. They're with they're just our people that are on our program. They all get together. They know each other. As Judge Portman says, when they come in and they see something going on, half the time they will comment to one of the probation officers or myself, hey, so-and-so's got something going on. We have unfortunately been told, uh, you know, when people have deceased, when people have died, somebody will pick up the phone and call the probation officer and say, hey, I, I heard on the street, you know, so-and-so uh, might have overdosed or something. Um, but when we get through to people, as Judge Portman has said, in our graduations, invariably, and I was shocked the first few times I heard people saying this, but they're consistent about it, and they say, you know, if things had been like this before, if somebody had treated me like this before, if, uh, you know, yeah, it was hard, and when I got in trouble, I didn't want to, I didn't want to have to do SWAP. SWAP's a sheriff work alternative program for people who aren't in Cook County. It's a, uh, uh, I want to call it a chain gang because it's not, but it's people who are uh, doing work under the supervision of the sheriffs for a day, eight hours. A day of SWAP is an eight-hour day. You show up very early. It's similar to our community service that we set hours on. Those people say, I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to get in trouble. I didn't want to get locked up if it was a hot drop. Um, but it was fair. And I can't argue with it after the fact. A lot of them don't like it at the time. But at the end of the day, especially when they're terminating, when they've seen wh what they can do, when they've gotten jobs, um, when uh, they've gone for six months without a violation and we're terming them early, even though they've got three or four or five more months of probation technically to go. Um, and. Uh, you know, when some people have probation that's uh, expungible, that's a huge thing. That could be three or four months earlier that you get your that you get your conviction expunged potentially, depending on if you maybe had task or why you were with us. But um, it has been an incredibly successful program. I, I, the way this has been run and way we've doing this, we've got bumps in the road. Um, it's very hard sometimes to keep the adversarial aspect out of it between the state's attorneys. We've had different state's attorneys. I, I happen to have been the public defender for a long period of time in this program, but sometimes that's been hard. But as Judge Portman said, we work as a team. The probation officers are all there. We discuss sanctions. We discuss, wait a minute, maybe we should throttle back on this guy for a minute because he's got some things going on. We're gonna put somebody on short court dates and see him every week if, we, if that's what we need to do. Uh, maybe while we're waiting for a bed and treatment. Um, but if you, everybody puts the work into it and is consistent about it, and as I said, my the biggest, the hardest thing is getting the clients to buy into this actually does work and it helps them. And they, as I said, it's been my experience that, shockingly, that the vast majority of people, there are always people who just fight it and don't want to do it and come to me and say, I, this is silly, man. I'm not putting up with this stuff anymore. Just get me some time and let me get out of here. Some people want to go back to doing that. That's on them. But... It's really amazing the number of people, number of clients, the number of people on probation who are looking, who are just dying for somebody to show them this kind of attention and to help them out. 
I, I am like the fifth probation officer on our team, especially when people are in trouble when they've got warrants because the probation department can't go out and deal with them then. I'm the one that goes to the house and says, look, I know you missed your drop. I understand what's going on. You gotta come back with me. Tomorrow morning, you gotta show up at 12. You gotta come back to this department. We're get, it's not gonna get better, it's getting worse. The fact that we are able to get that across to people, that they gotta be responsible, and if something messes up, take care of it now. Don't let it sit, don't hope it's gonna go away until it, it blossoms into something that destroys a huge chunk of your life. To see people responding and, and actually doing that and keeping their own jobs and telling us how, hey, I was late and I called my boss and told him I was on the train and my boss said, okay, cool, just get here by one and you won't get fired and that never happened to me before. It's fantastic to have people come in and tell us that stuff. So I, I got nothing else. Oh. Hi, I'm... Okay, I, uh, well, thanks very much. Uh, we look forward to uh, paying a visit uh, to your court here. Um, and uh, without further introduction, we'll just go uh, around the arc here. Hi, I'm Tom Johnson. I'm from Washington State. And I, I think Anna's probably going to talk about the history of how we got involved with Swiss Certain and Fair. So I'm going to focus a little bit more on lessons learned through implementation and what our next steps are. Um, so. Really, when we were assigned um, to implement Swift Certain and Fair in Washington State, it was relatively fast, and it made a lot of people nervous. Um, but I think that, you know, in the end, that probably was a good thing because we, we we didn't have the luxury of overthinking some of uh, you know some of the issues that we and challenges that we faced at the time. Um, so, a couple of things that were really successful in the implementation was is we built a problem solving team that was comprised of supervisors, a supervisor from every section. And I really can't um, speak enough about how important that was to have people who were actively involved in the work and who were gonna be responsible for carrying out that work, um, really designing and developing um, the processes and policies relative to that. So that was super successful for us. Um, the other, another thing that was really successful for us was bringing labor in and being really transparent about what we were doing. I think it was refreshing for staff to have um, a, a level of transparency that somewhat had been unprecedented, where we were open and clear about um, the development of the policies and we were responsive to um, the people who were doing the work. Uh, I think, you know, a couple of tactics that we deployed, um, you know, and avoided were probably equally as helpful. You know, we hear a lot about cultural change relative to staff, and we avoided having that conversation. Um, by, we don't, we didn't think in Washington State we needed a cultural change. We thought that our staff are, are really good, and the culture, you know, we want to support the culture that they wanted to do the right thing, and we didn't want to offend them by by talking about why they needed. Um, to change their beliefs around how to manage offenders. So I think by, by aligning with their beliefs, it, it assisted us in being able to have open communications and conversations about what this process would look like and have them inform those decisions. So we, we staged the implementation. Um, we allowed local problem solving. We trained at the unit level. Um, and we incorporated their ideas into the policy. So buy-in is always a bad term, I think, when you, when you talk about staff engagement, but it really did allow us to engage staff in, I think, a, a unique way, which afforded them the opportunity um, you know, not to be fearful of what this change may look like. So I think that was really important um, and certainly led to our success. We continued that th after the policies were drafted and we had began the implementation strategies um, by providing assistance and continued problem solving. Uh, you know, we had heard by and large that, you know, historically we had dropped a policy and then kind of walked away from, you know, being there to support people as they went to implement that policy. So by having subject matter experts deployed into the field, those subject matter experts that developed the policy, um, in, in every section, people could come um, and directly communicate with them about what should they do in this particular situation. I mean, you know, people who work in this field are amazing. There's so many different, there's so many different potential things that can occur. In order to try to draft that out in policy or define that in practice doesn't always work. So having somebody there who understood the principles of what we were trying to achieve uh, certainly assisted staff in getting it more right than wrong. 
In addition to that, we realized really early on that it wasn't just about the work that we do as an agency. It really is, is the entire criminal justice system. So begin to work extensively with stakeholders across the continuum, that, whether it's jails or prosecutors, victims groups, it didn't matter. Um, you know, we, we, we quickly began to, to develop um, some knowledge around what the agency was trying to do and become, part, uh, become a bigger part of the system as opposed to isolating ourselves. And I think that those were some of the things that were really, really important for us to focus in on. And if you're gonna take on this challenge, I think that those are some, um, you know, some methods that you can use in order to assist you in having successful implementation. But everything didn't work perfectly. Um, I mean, we've had some problems. Um, we focused largely on this initiative for 16 months um, as, we, as we rolled out the, the implementation of it. The problem with that is it's just too quick, right? I mean, 16 months for wide sweep and reform, um, we weren't able to complete certain things. Uh, we, we stopped paying attention to fidelity at a certain point, and we stopped um, addressing the operational challenges that people faced. So those are really important, I think, lessons learned for us. Uh, you know, when you talk about, you know, about staff feeling that this is a flavor of the month, and we've all heard those things time and time again, this is kind of what it goes back to. It goes back to how we, our attention span as an administration and as leadership. So we are now starting Swift and Certain 2.0 to, to go back and try to shore up some of those pieces. Uh, some observations that we've had, I think there's good observations and, and, and lessons learned from it. I mean, from the observations that we've seen, uh, particularly around fairness, with an offender is um, it's, it's really important because what happens is when an offender feels that they're being treated unfairly, they have a tendency to lash out. Um, the presumptive sanctions that we impose at three and thirty days, or three and then up to thirty days, um, re reduces uh, that that personalization between the, the 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 staff and the and the offender. Ultimately, I think it increases the safety of of, of our staff. We know that offenders are, are, are manipulative, and we know that they're risk takers. So having set sanctions for those offenders that happens every time, every time reduces that risk. It, you know, Angela talked about race, sex, and ethnicity uh, being no longer an issue. I think that that's a really important factor. They're, those are concerns that, that I know have been out there for a really long time amongst not only staff, but, but the offender population. In the end, for, for us, those things I think take a priority because as an administrator, if you, our, my primary role is to ensure that staff are as safe as possible. I think swift, certain, and fair, uh, certainly as a behavioral management model, aids to that end. And that's why I think I'm really, that's why I'm really supportive of the model. We also saw some other you know, observations that I, that I thought were kind of you know, fascinating. The short-term sanctions actually reduced um, or not reduced, but it actually made the offenders responsible for their lives again. They couldn't make excuses uh, about why they couldn't pay the rent, why they couldn't do this, or why they couldn't do that. So, you know, their, their ability to escape the responsibilities of life were certainly diminished, and I think that had a pretty, you know, profound impact on not only our staff who observed the fact that they ha still had to go out and do the same thing that every other staff member does, um, but certainly the offender who now doesn't want to be in violation because they have their rent due. Um, I think that often CCOs or parole officers um, have used confinement to manage workload, and I think that this eliminates that, it, or not eliminates it, but certainly reduces it, and I think that that's an important factor because it goes right back to the fairness issue around it. Um, we know now that, that um, resolving the barriers for field staff um, you know, to be successful is essential to fidelity of the model, uh, and that staff pay attention to what we do, so quality assurance relative to this model is, is incredibly important. Um, and we know that the model re requires a significant investment into the infrastructure in order for them to achieve it. 
So those, those are the, the things that we're looking at today in Swift and Certain 2.0 to try to um, correct to ensure that our staff are able to, to achieve what we've asked them to achieve in the policies. Um, it's been a fascinating experience so far, uh, and it's a great model. All right, I'm Chris Hoy, I'm the Chief Deputy with the Clackamas County Sheriff's Office in Oregon. Uh, I'm the person that Angela referred to earlier when she said uh, the folks that almost got kicked out of the DFE, that's me. So uh, I always enjoy being the comic relief or the uh, don't do it like they did, folks. It helps my ego a lot. So uh, I, I want to set the, set the stage because we, we really did have some struggles initially, but we really were able to turn it around. And I, I want to set the stage with the fact that we were in a, a demonstration field experiment. So our mission was to implement a model that, that existed in Honolulu. And uh, we had to do it with fidelity, and the, and, uh, the folks from Pepperdine helped us do that. But the, the, you know, I just want to say, you know, Angela talked about that earlier about what a DFE is. If you ever get the opportunity to participate in a demonstration field experiment, I highly encourage you to look at other options because uh, <laughs> it's, it's not so fun. But uh, we learned a lot from the process, and uh, we're very glad that we participated in it and now, now that we can look back on it. To give you a little bit of background, uh, our agency, Clackamas County, is uh, it's 1,880 square miles. So it's about three times the size of Oahu and about uh, one and a half times the size of Rhode Island. So the reason I'm saying that is because that's actually going to be relevant in this story a little bit with why we had some challenges. Uh, we have about 400,000 residents, and our county is very diverse in terms of ge geography. We go clear to the top of Mount Hood. That's in our you know, Timberline Lodge. That's our, our jurisdiction all the way down to uh, just the outer edges of the city of Portland. We have... Uh, the three most affluent communities in Oregon are in our county, but we also have uh, some of the poorest uh, areas of our of our state in our county. So it's uh, it's really a wide range of issues and problems that we're facing. Um, some of our folks have have ready access to transportation, and some literally have no access to transportation. And getting to our office. Uh, it can be, it's an hour and a half drive. I mean, it's, you know, so there are a lot of challenges that way logistically. The other key piece is that we're just about 15 miles down the, down the freeway from the state of Washington. And that's also relevant to the, to some of the challenges that we had. So the other thing I wanted to talk about in, by way of background uh, in Oregon is that we're, we're very, um, we kind of have a hodgepodge of rules and, um, as I suppose most states are, but I think it's really relevant to this issue because we were trying to figure out which offenders we could would be eligible for our HOPE program. And we supervise uh, probationers, uh, parolees, and what we call post-prison supervision, and also local control supervision. So uh, back in uh, 1997, the state decided that every, instead of sending people to prison for a year or less on uh, on revocations or uh, shorter sentences, all of those sentences would be served in the county jail. And with that sentence, the, the parole board authority, so to speak, would also come to the county level. So in Clackamas County, that meant that essentially I was the parole board for our local control offenders. So the, the people on local control supervision are the folks that have, that have been revoked out of regular probation. So that means that the, our worst offenders, the people we've had the least amount of success with, are the folks that are on that local control population. And, and the reason that became uh, relevant to this conversation is because we, d we didn't really have enough folks just on regular probation that met the criteria for HOPE. So we had to start looking and getting creative with who else could we put into our program. And so we ultimately decided that these local control offenders would be perfect. The problem was the judge has no authority over those folks uh, once they're on local control because they've been sentenced to prison and they're uh, under the jurisdiction of the local supervisory authority, and that's me. So we, tried to figure, we had to try to figure out a way to, to uh, take this sort of judge-centered program that is very much the, the scenario in Hawaii and bring it to Oregon where it's, we don't really have a, a judge-centered model so much. We've been sanctioning in Oregon f since the early 90s. Uh, my POs have arrest full arrest authority uh, and have had for you know, 
well over 25 years. So we weren't coming from the place where there was nothing, 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 and then a long prison sentence. We came from the place where sanctions were available to us. Um, and so we, we, that was the other uh, piece that we were very concerned about is that we didn't have a, a 20 or 30 year prison sentence hanging over the client's head. We could revoke, we could, if we were to revoke somebody's probation, in the beginning, we could sanction them up for up to 180 days on a revocation, and then uh, during the during the whole process, we had some budget issues, and uh, we were limited to a 60-day revocation. So that was the maximum penalty a person could get uh, if they if they we were revoking them out of hope. And so we were really concerned with, do, you know, is the big hammer uh, hanging out there? Was it a critical part of the program? And we really didn't know. And I think that we, you know, we. We don't have our results yet back. We're hoping to get them any time now, but uh, we we believe that it turns out it's not necessary. Um, so I just wanted to give you some of those uh, background uh, pieces of background information because the the big challenge we had was with the swiftness. That when you look at the swift, certain, and fair, we were having people who were uh, absconding from supervision, and so they weren't available for their sanctions. They were. They were leaving, they were either going to the state, they knew if they got to the state of Washington, which is just 15 miles up the road, uh, that we couldn't, you know, they'd go see our friends uh, in Washington, but they couldn't, we couldn't get them back because it turns out our governor's office wasn't on board with um, extraditing folks who were facing a two or three or four day jail sanction. They didn't want to spend the resources to extradite on somebody if, uh, on such a short sanction, so they said, no, thank you. And so. Um, that presented a, a big challenge. Uh, the other thing is, you know, like I mentioned, we have, you know, we have Mount Hood, we have wilderness area in our county. We have areas where um, it's just difficult to get to and it's easy to hide. And so we had folks who were absconding. And so we tried to engage a local, uh, the local uh, warrant strike team. Uh, we entered into a contract with them to help us. Uh, that didn't work out so well because it turns out our folks weren't a big priority for them because they were facing two or three day sanctions and they didn't understand, uh, they didn't buy into the fact that that was important. So um, ultimately what we did after a, a wonderful visit from uh, Judge Alm and uh, some fine folks from the Department of Justice uh, saying get your act together, or, you know, basically uh, you gotta, we gotta have to, we have to take care of the situation. We decided to become our own strike force, or our own warrant. Uh, we, we arrested folks on our own warrant. So basically what we had to do is we, we the, the parole and probation officers, we had a team of three at that point. They would spend the mornings going out, or the, in the office, uh, dealing with clients. That's when the color UA, was hap UA line was happening. So they would work uh, in the office in the morning, and then in the afternoon they would go out and they would just arrest people on warrants. And we, we were able to really turn that around when we started just taking we just basically uh, took responsibility for our own cases in terms of the arrests and, and really were able to bring that number down. The other thing that we were, I don't know that we were that unique amongst the other uh, DFE sites, but we, we have a major heroin uh, problem in Oregon as uh, there are, it exists in a lot of places, but we have heroin and we have uh, meth use. So the good news is we, have, we run our own inpatient alcohol and drug treatment program and so we were able to utilize that. But the heroin addiction problem, I think, was another uh, one of our biggest challenges that kept people sort of hiding uh, in, in the weeds where we weren't able to find them. But um, so all that being said, it, it really took a group effort of just getting creative, making sure everybody had uh, was on the same page in terms of where we were headed. I'm, I'm fascinated to, to listen to the public defender uh, going out and doing home visits. Um, our public defender initially was one of our bigger challenges. Um, you know, we found out that he was saying things to clients like, welcome to Vietnam, when they, when they found out they were in the HOPE program. And so we're like, oh boy, he doesn't quite get it. So uh, that was a challenge. So, yeah. And he had been to, he'd been to the site visits with us. He'd seen the, he, he under, you know, he'd been to the training. But I guess the point of that is don't assume that everybody, just because they've heard the information, buys into the principles or really understands the principles, make sure that you're talking about what swift, certain, and fair really means with everyone and, and do that uh, a lot. And it's important that you get, you know, you get your judge, of course, uh, the sheriff, your community corrections director, parole and probation, whatever you call it in your jurisdiction, your jail commander. 
if I, we had a little bit of a challenge with our jail commander initially in that he felt like uh, the HOPE program was filling up his jail. And so that was the narrative he was telling folks is that he was having to force release people because we were taking up all of his beds. And it turns out that wasn't actually the case, um, but we were able to work through that. And, and once he understood that, uh, that actually we were reducing the use of the jail by, with the HOPE program, he really was able to get on board. Um, so the, the, the other, I want to circle back to the other uh, challenge that we were dealing with in the beginning, and that's, um, I, I mentioned about the local control, and I, I, I mentioned this, I know it's very Oregon specific, but it, I think it could be relevant to other folks. Don't let the fact that you don't have um, a, law, a, a law that's convenient for the HOPE program get in your way. We ended up getting, um, you know, the I mentioned the judge didn't have jurisdiction over our cases, but what, but but we do, so I, I could sanction the person, but a judge couldn't. So basically, what we did is we, we uh, allowed the judge to act on our behalf, or that was our intent initially, was to act as my agent to sanction them. Well, unfortunately, um, you know, our Chief Justice of our Supreme Court got involved. He didn't particularly like that idea. Turns out there's this whole thing called separation of powers with uh, the executive branch and the judicial branch and we're the executive and she was in the judicial branch and we couldn't, we couldn't trade power. So um, the Constitution got in the way of that idea, but, but it didn't stop us because we still allowed the judge to uh, administer our program, have the conversations, talk to the clients about the level of sanction and then we would actually impose it in court. At the end of the day, it was just one of my POs signing off on the sanction rather than the judge's signature. So we were able to work through, work around an issue that kind of got really big. I mean, we never anticipated having involved the Chief Justice in our in our little program, but uh, we did, and it, and it all worked out in the end. So uh, I would just encourage you to, to be really flexible and be really uh, be creative, and I'll just keep looking for solutions when you run into those little barriers. And the, the nice thing about um, having sort of self-contained program where we have a lot of authority in Oregon is that you can be really nimble. And so if there's a way you can, you can create the ability to be nimble as you look at this, it's, I think it's very helpful. Um, so I, I just want to close by saying I was talking with one of our former HOPE clients the other day. She's in our drug and alcohol treatment program now. And I was talking to her about, I said, hey, I'm getting ready to go to talk to some folks about, uh, about the HOPE program. And you've been on supervision before. What did, what do you prefer? What do you think is the best way to do business? Is the way we, we used to do probation or the HOPE program? And she was just adamant that uh, the HOPE probation was the best, uh, the best supervision for her. Uh, and I said, well, why, you know, why is that? And her thing was, it, it, she, had a, she felt like she had a dedicated team of people that were there all on the same page trying to help her be successful. And that was really the key. Um, and I thought that was really impactful coming directly from a client. I mean, we talk about that, you know, we think about it intellectually, but she was living it. And <clears throat> so this is literally just earlier this week where she told me these things. And the other thing is that, that it, she got out of it is that she, it, made, it, it empowered her to be responsible for the outcome. Those weren't the words she used, but that's, that's what she said. Uh, Basically, because there's certainty when, with certain violations, if, you're, you know, if you miss a UA, if you miss a, an office visit, you know what's going to happen. She knew she was in control of whether she was going to go to jail or not. By, and, and that was very empowering for her because in the past that wasn't always the case. She always saw herself as the victim, as the system out together, as the PO out together, as they weren't on her side. I mean, she told me, she says, I love, and it, Angela was asking me about this PO earlier, she goes, I love, Michelle Rickle, she's awesome. I mean, I, I can't wait to see her again. And this, she's talking about her PO here, a PO who had, who had been her Hope Court PO. And that's, you know, that's pretty amazing in our, in our world. So anyway, I think I'll stop with that. Hello, my name is Sonia Dunlap. I uh, work for the Ohio Department of Rehabilitation and Corrections as the project coordinator over the SWIFT Certain and Fair Grants. Um, just to give you a little background information on our department, our department has about 400 parole staff, um, who, some of whom provide probation services to about half of the counties in Ohio. Um, our parole staff, they're authorized to arrest 
offenders. They uh, do carry firearms, and they are also authorized to administer sanctions. Um, so just to give you a little background as to why we decided to adopt the use of the Swift Certain model, um, we took a look at the rates of successful completion for our probation um, and judicial release clients. And what we, what we noted was that those rates were pretty much remaining the same. Um, they were stabilizing. And it was at a level that we did not consider to be satisfactory. Um, so despite many of our efforts uh, on a local level, a state level, and a federal level, um, we just weren't really seeing the outcomes that we wanted to see among our probation and our judicial release uh, clients. So what we did is we started to explore ways to improve those outcomes, and that's how we uh, started looking into the swift, certain, and fair model for our, for our department. Um, we, we partnered up with our research and we reviewed data for all of the counties in Ohio for which we provide probation services. And what we did is we identified counties with common characteristics where we could receive the maximum benefit for engaging or implementing the SWIFT Certain and Fair model in those counties. Um, some of the common characteristics for the counties where we are piloting SWIFT Certain and Fair uh, are that there is one county common pleas judge for uh, three of the counties where we initially started. Um, the, the counties that we decided to pilot are all rural counties with very limited resources. Uh, when I say limited resources, I mean limited treatment resources. I also mean limited jail resources. Uh, in some counties that we are piloting, we don't even have a jail. Um, so that is something, and that's one of the reasons why we explored um, alternate sanctions, which Angela alluded to, early to the, earlier today. Um, additionally, each one of the counties have comparable numbers of offenders who have been sentenced to community control or released on judicial release supervision. And lastly, um, independent of our initiatives, to implement swift, certain, and fair in these counties, the counties themselves were already starting to explore ways to hold offenders more accountable for technical violations without increasing their revocation numbers. So they were already looking in, into ways to do that. Um, so we decided to pilot uh, back in 2015. We started our pilot with three counties, um, Auglaize County, Jackson County, and Pike County. Um, in Auglaize County, we decided to model the pilot um, just as the pilot in Hawaii. So we are using a jail sanction in Auglaize County. Um, what is important for you to know is that uh, the cost of using the jail sanction is roughly about $89 per day for each offender that is placed in jail. Okay, um, The jail agency there is willing to, um, you know, has available space that can accommodate this type of model in their county. So we did decide to use that for Auglaize County. Now Jackson County, on the other hand, uh, does not have the jail space to accommodate uh, a jail sanction like this in that county. So what we decided to do was to implement the use of electronic monitoring uh, GPS um, device for our sanction in that county. Um, as I mentioned, the jail sanction costs us about $89. The electronic monitoring device costs us about 6 to $9, somewhere between $6 and $9. So as you can see, there's a significant price point difference between using the jail sanction and using an electronic monitoring sanction for our, for our offenders. Um, in Pike County, we uh, Pike County is one of the counties uh, that has limited jail resources. They don't even have a jail. They actually have a, a memorandum of understanding with a neighboring county uh, to use their local uh, detention facility. But uh, since there is not a jail there, we decided to explore the option of residential programming at a halfway house. Um, as I mentioned, Pike County is one of the counties with limited resources. So the halfway house is not even in the county. It's also in another county. Um, but, and, and 
we'll talk about that a little more when I talk about some of the challenges <laughs> that, that that poses. But um, as I mentioned, and I'll just kind of reiterate that the, the cost of the jail sanction in, in our state, and it does vary depending on the jail, but for this pilot, it was $89. The cost of the electronic monitoring sanction was anywhere between six and $9. And then the cost for the halfway house uh, sanction was 45. So it was important for 45 per day, that is. So I, I bring that to your attention and I mention that because with limited resources, including limited um, funding, um, it, we did have to become innovative and explore alternate sanction opportunities. Um, and so it, with our initial pilot, that does give us an opportunity to see which sanction, uh, if it matters, which sanction we use, um, and if so, um, which sanction is the most appropriate to use in this type of a model. Um, in 2016, we did embark on our fourth pilot. <laughs> so we have uh, another county uh, that we've added on to the pilots. It is Stark County. Stark County is a bit different from the other three. Stark County is considered an urban area. Um, there are a lot more resources, a lot more offenders that are placed on supervision in uh, Stark County. Um, there are five county common police judges uh, that have been elected in Stark County. For Stark County, we are using a day jail um, or day reporting. We use the words interchangeably for this pilot, but we are using a day jail sanction. Uh, it's essentially the offender reports to the day jail center. They are there for eight hours with a very minimal activity. Um, there are pre-approved uh, reading materials that are available to, available to them, and we are exploring um, some self-help and self-learning opportunities for them uh, that have yet to be implemented. Uh, at this time, we do not have a cost that's associated with that, but to give you an idea, there is one jail monitor, day jail monitor, that sits in the facility with the offender. It's kind of a, an open room. Um, and there are up to 20 people that can sit there at one time. So I imagine that you will see that the cost will still be um, less than that of a jail sanction. Um, some of the challenges that we faced as we uh, rolled out our pilots in the initial set of pilots, uh, with, with the Auglaise County pilot, which is the pilot where we are using the jail sanction, uh, the judge had some concerns about uh, staff members, our parole staff, and the authority they had to issue a jail sanction. Um, so the judge was okay, however, with including specific language in a journal entry that allowed for our staff to do so. So essentially, the judge is sentencing the offender to 180 days in a jail as a jail sentence and then he suspends that sentence and allows for the probation officer to administer the sanction and that was kind of something that we had to discuss it was something that I myself didn't understand I'm, I'm not you know I've not worked I'm not a judge <laughs> I'm a line staff member uh, so it, it did take some time for me to wrap my, my brain around that but it was we had to collaborate with the judge in order to accomplish this, and that's what I'm really trying to, to uh, want to bring to your attention. It was important for the judge to mention that he had concerns about due process in that regard and what was appropriate for our staff members to do, and then he came up with the idea of how to overcome that, that obstacle and that challenge. Um, so that was, that was essential. One of the other challenges that we faced, as I mentioned, is just uh, lack of resources. Um, spe specifically with the Pike County uh, pilot, which is the halfway house uh, sanction, the county where we use the halfway house sanction. Uh, staff expressed uh, great challenges with managing the time, um, and as we, because as I mentioned, the halfway house is not in the county. So as we are embarking on increased drug screening, and we are, as a result, having increased sanctions, we are also expecting staff to transport offenders about 40 minutes away to a halfway house immediately. Um, it was a huge disruption not only for our, the offenders, but it was a disruption for our staff members as well. So we had to, to kind of sit back and explore opportunities to um, ease the 
the strain of, of, of this issue. So what we had to do is we collaborated with our local halfway house and we actually were able to hire a staff member that is dedicated to uh, the SWIFT certain model. Um, and so what that staff member does is they are is the case manager. Uh, they are responsible for picking the offender up from the uh, probation office and transporting the offender to the halfway house. And then while at the halfway house, they continue to engage the offender in direct interventions uh, to uh, really talk about what led to the offender being at the halfway house. So I bring all of that to your attention again because it did require a collaborative effort with our stakeholders to really uh, resolve the issue at hand. Um, so I encourage you, as you are deciding if the SWIFT certain and fair model is appropriate for your agencies, to just be flexible um, and know that you know if you are piloting this model, that you will need to remain flexible and listen to your staff um, and try to resolve the issues by by including your staff in the resolution, um, you know, for the issue. Um, also, be, just be informed, collect data on, on your pilots or on, on this model if you're going to do that in your agencies and share that information uh, with your stakeholders. Uh, that's, that's equally as important. Um, I, I'm responsible for collecting the data for our agency and uh, I have recently started sharing the data with the, all of the stakeholders, the judges, the treatment providers, and the line staff. And you'll get some interesting um, competitive, uh, oddly enough, uh, feedback from, from those individuals as they start to review the data and look at how many positive drug screens they're receiving, how many sanctions are being administered, how many warrants are still out there. They'll start to really look for ways to improve their numbers, and that's important. So, thank you. I go this way. I get a choice. I'll go yeah. this way. All right. And I get a clicker. I'll tell you the folks. That, hi, I'm Bob Brennan. I am a judge in Salem, Massachusetts. Um, oh, look, there I am. Let me just see if it, can I work it. Point to the computer. No, that's a laser. Oh yes. Ah, no, I went backwards. All right. No. Did I jump it? No. Nope. Oh, I'm good. All right. Um, so I'm from Salem, Massachusetts. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, Salem, although the folks from Pepperdine might not know, is actually about more than just Halloween and witches and warlocks. Uh, and this is one of the things we do. So um, Massachusetts Swift, Certain, and Fair is traditional hope probation, as you've heard, uh, based on the Hawaii model that Judge Alm started. Um, we began with co-pilot programs. Uh, in Salem Superior Court, in Salem District Court, which is my court. Um, we're now running in four courts across the state and are in the process of expanding. We're just out to myself and a, a little smaller team, out to a group of courts in the last several weeks, and we hope to be up and running in eight more courts um, by the beginning of the summer. And if I had to kind of read the tea leaves, I would say that uh, swift, certain, and fair is how Massachusetts is going to be doing high-risk probation across the board uh, five years from now. So. So let me give you a little context and history, if I could, just to start off. Um, probation in Massachusetts is under the judiciary, uh, as opposed to parole, which is in the executive branch. Um, so historically, uh, Massachusetts courts and the district court where I am in particular have been fairly probation-centric. Um, in fact, uh, as you can see up there, the actually, we like to think we invented everything, but truly, <laughs> the first probationary service in the United States uh, formal probationary service was uh, in Massachusetts in 1878. Um, so despite a century and a half of experience, <laughs> Massachusetts probation as usual is, is too often inefficient, random, and ineffective. Uh, and as people have alluded to, it lacks credibility with probationers themselves. So as you may know, you guys got it. So uh, Dwight Schrute is not a judge in Massachusetts, nor a probation officer. Uh, but he could be one of us, as you probably are reading along with me. Um, discussing probation violation processes because that's pretty much what probation as usual looks like right there. I hope everybody can see it. Um, if I were sitting in the back, I might not be able to. Um, but in any event, so I, I, I got a kick. I, I will say a good friend and a judge in the next court over for me actually has uh, those yellow short sleeve shirts. He's the only other guy I know that has them, but I can't tell you, but it's not him. Um, so for years in Massachusetts, uh, judges and probation officers 
were applying SWIFT and certain principles, myself included, but we did it um, before we heard of HOPE in a sporadic uh, case by case uh, basis with really no overall purpose or ability to measure the results. Um, and then along comes uh, 2010 and uh, strategic planning and I think it was a national trend. I noticed in some of the materials I read about Illinois that you had a similar initiative in 2009. Um, but so uh, we have the strategic plan, five year plan for the trial court. Um, it focused on uh, evidence-based practices and these were all the new buzzwords that came out. Um, but mostly as it related to uh, the criminal justice side, we were looking at recidivism reduction. So the goal for us was recidivism reduction. Uh, we were far less focused on cost savings, although that was certainly a, a side benefit. And my phone is ringing. That's my brother. All right. Call him later. He's Sorry. Heard about your <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> you probably did heard about, heard about how I'm messing. He would laugh because he's kind of tech savvy. Um, so how do we implement SWIFT, Certain, and FAIR in Massachusetts? Well, uh, it began, again, um, with a steering committee. Uh, there was a judge in, a uh, chief judge in Massachusetts who had heard about HOPE at a national meeting that she went to. She thought it would be a great idea, started to roll it in. Uh, this steering committee, 30 plus people, really top heavy. Um, kind of top people from the trial court, uh, administration from the office of probation, police brass, people like that. Um, so you can well imagine, I actually sat through many, many, many meetings, um, really boring meetings. But uh, we managed to move it forward slower than I would have liked, uh, but I was sort of a small voice in that group. And ultimately though, we applied for and received a BJA grant, uh, became one of the uh, four courts in the mainland, as have you heard, to do this demonstration field experiment. Um, we didn't have, as uh, you know, Chris talked about it, don't, don't ever do one. Our experience has not been that bad, but we met, you know, these fantastic, amazing people, um, Angela and Jonathan, and, and yeah, Chris, you know. <laughs> um, and we're up and running in October 2012 with our first warning hearing. It sounds simple uh, when I listen to myself say it, but really in a lot of ways it was anything but. Um, we live in, again, a state where um, while we like to think of ourselves as progressives, we can be as entrenched and stodgy as anybody can possibly find. And so you had entrenched beliefs, you had uh, traditional approaches, system disconnects that just didn't work. So there were a variety of challenges. And I'm going to try and take them through, take you through them, at least as we experienced them, and hopefully give you some insight uh, one by one, just as to the swiftness, the certainty, uh, and the fairness. Click. Look at that. So first problem we had is, um, well, I'll talk to, we, I'm going to talk about warning hearings, testing, and warrants in one other, one other uh, area. First problem we had was, how do you get to the warning hearing quickly? Because that is essential. You've got to let people know up front what it's all about, that we support them, but that there are consequences. This is going to look different from the probation they've been on in the past. Um, our key criterion for HOPE eligibility was high-risk probationers. And we were using the Ohio uh, risk assessment system. I'm not sure if you use it here. Um, yes, no, maybe. But in any event, if you don't, let me tell you, the ORAS, the o Ohio Risk Assessment System, um, assesses probationers into high risk, uh, medium risk, low risk categories, things of that sort. Um, it is a 50 plus page questionnaire that for at least our probation people uh, who are, have fairly high caseloads, it's taking them a month to complete with each probationer. That just was not going to work. Um, that was going to crack the process before we even started. So what we did was we got a little creative. There is a four question screening tool. There it is. And we actually looked at it and determined that there was a pretty close correlation uh, between, at least on the high risk and the very high risk people, between those who scored in on the uh, screening tool and those who ultimately would have scored in with a full assessment. So what this allowed us to do is I, I put someone on probation, they go down to the probation department, take some, what, how long could that possibly take to do that? 10, 15 minutes? And then we know that day if they're HOPE eligible. So it really enabled scheduling the warning hearing, which we needed to do uh, within a week. We do weekly warning hearings every Thursday morning. Um, if we didn't have this, couldn't have done it. Next issue we really was with testing. I'm gonna really skip through this, I think, because testing mostly is about uh, money and resources. We had them uh, because we had federal funding. I will say as a side note, though, uh, one of the judges that started with me, uh, by the name, guy by the name of Matt Nestor, moved to a different court. He loved HOPE so much that he started it there without anything, without any support, and he got creative. They didn't have money for drug testing. Um, so he and his chief reached out to a local community college 
they got interns who wanted to be criminal justice people, and you know, price to pay was uh, collect a cup of urine. So there you go. So there are ways to, to do it. Um, the next one, and a really big challenge for us, and people have alluded to it along the panel, is, is warrants. If we're going to be credible, if we're going to make this work, um, how do we get around the system, at least that we had, where a warrant is entered into a computer, it goes over to the police, but there's no real active uh, pursuit. Um, if a police happens to bump into someone, and, I'm, and I mean this all respect to the police officers, that's not what they're supposed to do, unless they're on the warrant apprehension team, they'd pick them up. If they arrest them on some, but something else, they run them, and they find they have a warrant. That was not going to work if we were going to be quick, if we were going to be swift uh, as we needed to be. So we needed to crack that culture. The key here was uh, having an absolutely terrific police liaison who was invested, fully invested in hope. Um, so it took a lot of collaboration. Are these lights up and dipping and it lightning? Kind of it's kind of weird. <laughs> All right. Um, so it took, a, it, it, <laughs> it took a great deal of collaboration. Um, and it, it was really, uh, I can't speak enough about how important that is to have that little level of communication and collaboration. Uh, and we worked out a system where basically uh, once a warrant is issued for a hope probationer in the courtroom, the clerk's office, my clerk's office, faxes it immediately to the police department with a follow-up email. Uh, the officers in charge at the department have been trained and brought into the uh, brought into the fold by our liaison, who happens to be a lieutenant over at the Salem Police, um, and they know that their job at that point is to, to get it to the guys on the street, and then the guys on the street actually actively go out and do it. Um, I didn't think it was a big deal at the time, but I'm told it was. Uh, what we did was the other lead judge, the Superior Court judge, and I went to the roll call at the police department. Um, we explained to them what it was about. We thanked them for really doing a great job. It was a little after we started. We gave them some feedback on what their efforts were meaning, uh, what they meant, I should say. Um, and my sense is in talking to the lieutenant that uh, the police ended up taking a, a terrific amount of pride in the speed that they were, uh, that they were bringing people in. So actually, <laughs> true story, we had to slow them down because we, under the HOPE model, we really wanted to give people some opportunity to be responsible and come in on their own. And we were sending warrants out, and like an hour later, they're in front of me. And I'm like, okay, hang on. So, so this worked great. So there are, it, it does work. Um, the last aspect is uh, how do we get swift violations? Um, probation officers is pretty clear. I mean, you just have to set a policy and set a culture, and, and most of the people we had were absolutely terrific in terms of stepping up to it. It's a little more touchy when we talk about partner agencies, uh, Office of Community Corrections that we have, um, batters programs, drug treatment, mental health treatment programs, et cetera. So to us, I mean, really, we talk about communication. Communication is so imperative. Um, reinforcement and reminder are also uh, essential. Um, this next slide will kind of give you a sense of that. This is a two, full two years into hope, and I thought we were doing just great. Uh, and we communicated everything we needed to about, you know what, when someone has a problem, I know this is how you deal with it now, you gotta let the PO know at my court and we gotta let it, you know, get them in. As you can see, and I have no doubt that the person who did this, who was working from, and this is at a correction center, which is uh, uh, a high supervision place that's a step down from jail, uh, and essentially, as you look at it, you have, um, 18 violations over a span of 10 weeks between January 22nd and March 23rd before we even saw this person. So clearly the message had not been delivered well enough. That was on us. Um, the idea is, now in this particular one, I don't recommend such a heavy-handed approach. When I saw this, I, I, I almost spun out of my chair. And uh, I basically said, well, I guess we're not sending anybody to OCC anymore. So that's the end of that. And then uh, two days later, I had the head of Office of Community Corrections in my courtroom asking for a meeting. We straightened it out, and the rest is history, I think, until the next time. Um, this sort of uh, segues a little bit into the certainty, because not only does that pose problems for, for swiftness, but certainly for certainty, because that's not the type of message that we want to send, and that really undermines what we were trying to do. Um, but um, again, as I think Chris said, biggest issue for us for certainty was that, uh, and when I talk about certainty, what I talk about, and I think it's, it's echoed here, is a consequence every time a violation is adjudicated, and for us at least, with the population we're dealing with, almost always a jail sentence because we're dealing with high risk. It doesn't mean it has to be that. Uh, there are different permutations, uh, and we've actually, I'll talk a little bit about we've come off that somewhat. 
But Massachusetts law, unfortunately, uh, does not permit people to serve sentences in installments. So if you have an adjudication of a violation, I have a couple of choices. I can just continue the probation and say, do better. I can modify it and add conditions or take conditions away as the need arises, or I can revoke and sentence. If I sentence, however, under, you can see this is one of several cases in Massachusetts, long-standing principle, um, I have to give them the whole sentence. And so by sanctioning people with a couple days here, a couple days there, essentially that was perceived as well. You know what, you can't punish them like that. That's giving them their sentence piecemeal in installments. Um, we got creative. Uh, what we did was we looked at our rules and um, we have, under our rules in the district court, we have uh, probation proceedings that permit after we do a preliminary hearing before we have a final hearing on a probation. If probable cause is found, you can detain someone. Um, we use that. I guess the, the message here is you have to be flexible and creative if you can do so at least in a legal, legally colorable way and a way that you feel is principled. And you know, as I've said in subsequent meetings, uh, I had a little bit of difficulty with this at the beginning. Obviously, I've been doing it for four years. I got over it. Um, we tried to fix it legislatively. And then my other slide that I pulled out because I didn't want to offend people is I had, I had a huge pig because the amount of pork they wanted to throw onto our, our very simple one paragraph legislation that would have fixed this problem. Uh, we couldn't have, I was in with the, I guess we're not being recorded, I don't know, but if we are, the uh, head of the state uh, Senate Judiciary Committee. We couldn't have run out of that office fast enough. That's how bad it was. Um, the other uh, situation was, you know, we deal with certainty. The concern was from both probation officers and judges, um, the lack of discretion. Um, and, um, and how do we make sure that we're doing the same thing all the time? So what we did was we created this detention grid. Um, it's kind of funny. I always say, okay, is that really a grid? It's two to four, two to four, two to four, two to four, and then we get two exceptions. But what it does serve is two things. It's a concrete reminder um, that we need to be consistent in that way. Uh, and secondly, although it's a small range, it does at least give people the sense, the judge's sense that they have some discretion because there is a little bit of a range there that you can work within. Um, there is, you know, on some level, there has been a, a jail only objection uh, and we've dealt with that. Um, and that segues in some way into my discussion about some of the, the uh, some of the impediments to certainty. Um, but what we did in that, and I think I was kind of listening to Angela earlier, was great, is we evolved. Um, we looked at this and said for certain circumstances, that's actually not updated. And I'm in the process of meeting with some other judges to sit down and, and actually put together a sort of a statewide one. But um, we now do um, a half day or a full day in the lockup in court. Um, in the Worcester, one of the other offshoots uh, that uh, Swift Certain Affairs is working with, uh, they do sit in court and watch. I think, uh, I think you guys did that. We don't check them in, we don't sing them songs, but we do, <laughs> you know. That's the, that's the, see, that's the thing, because when you're, when you're elected, you've got to be dynamic. When you're appointed for life, you can kind of, you know, you don't have to, okay? Uh, <laughs> so let me, talk, um, let me talk lastly, I think, at least in this, on this about um, the challenges we have about being fair. And it shouldn't, it sounds funny for me to say we have a real challenge about being fair. But contextually, uh, to me, from a swift, certain, and fair model, fairness means three things. Uh, the probationer is connecting the behavior to the consequence, number one. Number two, it's the same for everybody. And number three, that it's short, it's brief, it's measured. And you can see our two to four days, just you know, is really one night or two, because if you're there, that counts as a day if you set foot in for one second. Um, we found up front, the first thing we found, um, three basic areas, mental health, in sort of the fidelity versus discretion I've already discussed in the jail concerns. Um, with mental health, here's what we found. Uh, we had people who were dual diagnosis, and um, they just kept violating, and bring them in and send them for two days, and we'd see them again in a few weeks. And it became pretty clear that they weren't connecting the consequence to uh, the behavior. And so we sat down as a group, we met together uh, and we decided that for people who were demonstrably and diagnosed uh, significantly mentally ill, this just didn't work. So we just cut them out. We just, we just didn't think that uh, hope probation was appropriate for them. Um, as far as the fairness as it relates to the same for all, uh, again, we had a real issue and we have it more so as we spread it with judges feeling like, well, I have, what about my discretion? Probation officers, well, I should have discretion. And I guess what we did was we talked folks through it. And we said, you know what the discretion that you have is, 
sure it's more limited, but part of the discretion is taking the first step into this and understanding that this appears to work better than what we're doing. Um, and secondly, with win within that, you have some wiggle room to work with. With the probation officers, uh, one of the guys that I work with uh, by the name of Sean Whalen, terrific probation officer. I think he's the best at this that I've seen, but I'm sure that's just because he's in my court. Um, he always tells the POs, and he did so. We did this recent training. We walked around the state um, last several weeks. Um, he tells probation officers, you don't really lose discretion. What you do is you get a timeout. And he said, think about the fact that you know, you got someone who's in crisis, and you got a violation, and you've got to figure out, find a program, do something, do this, and you've got to do it now. What this does is it gives you a day or two to figure out what you want to do and how to exercise your discretion well. And so, sure, they're locked up for a day or two, but at the end of the day, you're not losing your discretion. You're just exercising it in a different way. I mean, it may just be a lot of talk, but I think it did, it did, um, it did resonate with a lot of the probation officers to whom he spoke. The last one is more of a practical one. We found that um, as far as the short component of the fairness, that people were getting measured short couple-day sanctions, uh, detentions, if you will, that um, the jail was finding that some people were violating on purpose uh, because they knew that they were only going to go for a day or two. And there was pressure either from the outside or the inside for them to smuggle contraband in. Um, right. So for people in corrections, that was a big problem. Um, what we did, and again, as we've done, I think, throughout, and which, which I would hope if, if, if you worked it through and you do it, you do is you just keep talking. You got to talk. So the point person, the guy that we have over at uh, the Sheriff's Department called us, said, hey, there's a problem here. We sat down and we talked, and we worked out a system where at the front end in the courthouse, we actually separate HOPE detainees into a different cell um, so they can't be passing stuff back and forth. And then when they got over there, they just screen them a little more closely. Um, and I think the word got out pretty quickly, you know, the word got out that it says we're going to fly anymore. Um, I was really prepared, and I don't mean, I, don't, I really don't, because I'm, I'm, although, uh, whatever. I, I was really prepared to the, to the one guy who was really doing this, I was really prepared um, to actually send him, so send him, but I, it, it did, we couldn't, they didn't put the case together, I never saw it, but uh, so he was looking at max sentence, and that was going to be whoosh, message, but in any event. Um, so let me just sum up. What are, what are the lessons learned here? Um, I just mentioned, I said, communicate, you know, when I say create buy-in, it doesn't mean be a salesperson. Um, and I think, as Angela said earlier, it doesn't mean just lecture people, it means listen. I mean, communicate to me is, is a two-way street. Um, but explain, give the numbers, because I think that can be the most compelling part. Um, and uh, bring in all the people who are going to be impacted. But I do that, at least in my perspective, is maybe it's just because I'm a judge and I get to tell people what to do all the time. Um, I say do it in a way when you're rolling it out, if you do it, that doesn't seek permission, that just invites uh, response and suggests inclusion, but is really a done deal other than the fine details. Because otherwise, if you, if you do it that way, you'll never get it done. Um, pick your team. That means, uh, I will say, again, I told you about this huge, cumbersome group that we started with. Um, as we've moved it out now, we're a lot leaner and faster, which is good uh, and consistent with the idea. Um, we just have, it's myself, another judge, um, a probation representative, a police officer, and a sheriff's a department person. Those are your core people, and you need to get the public defenders involved, and you get the DAs, but if you don't have that core group, this is never going to work. And so that's how we've kind of moved it out. Um, and the last one is beware of drift. Um, and that means personal drift. I, I struggle with this all the time. This is hard work, at least. And I, and I, I, I will say, um, I'm not as invested as our drug court people, it sounds like, who are more um, like Judge Portman, who really get involved. And in some ways, that's preferable to me because I don't mind being a little bit of a step back, but still having some better connection. Um, but you have a lot of sad excuses from sad people. And I think the hardest part, as you do it year after year, is that um, you stay away from making the exception because the exception quickly becomes another exception. Uh, and then you lose the whole thing. Um, and system-wide, we found it's, we'd exp we've expanded it. We're trying to bring people in and get other judges and probation chiefs to embrace. You know, we've had to compromise in some way. And I think that's okay as long as you don't compromise on the core principles. The core principles obviously being, you know, it's got to be fast. Uh, you got to have some consequence, whatever that may be, for every single violation that's adjudicated. And it's got to be measured and fair and same for everybody. Um, I'm going to start, or I'm going to end, I guess, where we began uh, with a little history. Come on. This fine-looking fellow right there is uh, John Augustus, who uh, is known as the father of probation, another Massachusetts guy. Um, he was a bootmaker who, over 18 years, supervised 2,000 probationers. Now, 
Uh, whether it's urban legend or creative statistical analysis, I don't know, but they say only four failed. So 0.2% is pretty aspirational, I get, and not likely achievable. But, but I'll say this, I guess, in closing, and I was told by Jonathan, I don't have any, I don't have any stake in this, I don't get royalties from this, um, I'm not trying to sell necessarily. I will only say this, um, I started this process again five years ago. Uh, I'm generally kind of a skeptical optimist, but I was pretty skeptical. I was like, okay, here's another program, here we go. Um, I've turned 180 degrees. Um, Swift Certain Fair to me is the best program that I have seen in over 25 years in this business. Um, it's simple, it's straightforward, it's relatively cheap, um, and uh, I couldn't recommend it more highly. So I thank you very much for listening. I'm going to pass it to my left and turn this off. Oh, maybe we'll leave John up there. Leave John up there. Well, good afternoon. My name is Anna Alward, and I'm from Washington State with Tan. Um, I have the great opportunity to bring this panel home um, today, and, and you can hear from the people who spoke before me just the passion and the expertise that is that is across the country when you look, talk about swift, certain, and fair. And um, so it's a pleasure to kind of to bring that to the to end of, of the panel time. I. Um, I won't go through a lot of, of facts about the history of Washington State. Some Tons spoke very well of it, but as well, other agencies have talked about their peculiarities or their individual idiosyncrasies that are Washington State, we have our own as well. And I think the message I'm hearing from the panel and the message we're trying to share is that wherever you're at, if you can apply those principles, that you can make a significant improvement in the criminal justice continuum. And, and trying to, again, as Dr. Hawkins said this morning, we can listen and then try to help you figure out where is the best place to implement swift, certain, and fair, and how to do that in an effective way. In Washington State, what I will follow up with is we, we have had the luxury of um, being in existence since May 2012. Um, and we have had an independent evaluation. We had the Arnold Foundation in combination with Washington State University, as Dr. Hawken re referred to this morning. And um, they did a, a outcome and, in, and uh, implementation evaluation of Swift Certain in Washington State, and we've had some really good results, and I want to share those with you. And I'm sharing them with you because I'm really proud, and I'm proud of the work that's been done. But I so echo what Tan talked about earlier: is that, and many of the of the panelists have spoken to. Whenever you get to a certain point of implementation, there's continued review and evaluation because there's something else that needs to be tended to and altered and adapted so that you can continue to adhere to the principles. And I think that again, as panelists have said, when you have those uh, principles and you can adhere to them, that really gives you the only structure you need for this implementation. But the outcome review that we had, and, and it, was, it was a pretty sound research um, perspective, and we, um, it was published um, just last fall, and so we certainly can share that with people um, that might be interested in it. But one of the things that we certainly had is we, ha we found they found significantly less confinement following violation. Well, yeah, I mean, that was that was by, by design. Generally, prior to Swift and Certain, our average day of confinement was 40 days in jail, and that went down to an average of 16 days confinement in jail. Um, so we reduced confinement time by at least 20%. The better the the larger aspect of that that the study bears out is that there is no I negative impact to public safety. So while we had a significant reduction in confinement time, and a significant reduction in persons on probation and supervision who were being confined for their violation of of supervision, there w there was no impact to to public safety, and in fact, there was a 20% reduction in the odds of any conviction of someone who is a participant in Swift and Certain, and a 30% reduction in a chance of violent uh, conviction. And so the, the ability to not only have less confinement, but to have less confinement that had no negative impact, and in fact had a reduction in recidivism, was significant in Washington State. One of the reasons that 
I, it's hypothesized, and, and the research will talk about um, those, the people that were in Swift and Certain, or people in Washington State on probation, have significantly increased their program utilization. Again, part of that is because when there is an interruption, it is for one, two, to three days. It's not for a significant amount of time. And so generally, um, chemical dependency treatment or cognitive behavioral interventions can continue. They aren't aborted or have to start over. So we had increased um, utilization of programs during the time of, of the study. We also found in the study um, showed that there was a reduced probability for um, technical or non-serious violations, and they compared that to previous times in history. But they also, that participants had a reduction in serious violations. So across the board, whether it was technical or a high-level violation, or, or they called it non-serious and serious, that all violations had decreased, but the technical violation decreasing a bit more. Significant, significant improvement in our, in our system through Swift and Certain. One of the, we have the Institute for Public Policy in Washington State, much like the authority here in Illinois, a real think tank and a real useful um, tool uh, for the legislature and for rulemaking. And the w Washington State Institute for Public Policy d has a great uh, kind of plug and play model on um, cost, save, cost benefit analysis in criminal justice continuum and criminal justice projects. So when um, we put our swift and certain uh, participants through um, a pretty stringent cost benefit, cost savings analysis. What the research showed is that the participants in Washington State and Swift and Certain had lower correctional and, co and associated costs, like victims' costs, et cetera. And the cost savings ratio was at $16 saved for every dollar. Um, invested in Swift and Certain, significant savings. And we were able um, to save, to put some of those savings into additional treatment beds. I think that the first year we had an additional 10,000 uh, opportunities for chemical dependency treatment and for um, cognitive behavioral interventions in the community by that, by that confinement saving. So it really did pay off in the long run. Um, we, we, are very proud of the fact that we've reduced the length of confinement with no, no impact, no harm to public safety, but that certainty of the sanction is the key combined with the graduated sanction responses. In, in Washington State, while we generally will stay from one to three days, the cap or the maximum amount of time that anyone can get for a violation of supervision is 30 days. So we're talking about significantly short times that really have, according to the research, have profound found impacts on the system as a whole. Again, we use those dollars back to into treatment options and, and continuing to apply quality assurance to the process, as Tan talked about as well, um, trying to make sure that we're not drifting, trying to make sure that we're holding true to the principles is an ongoing um, emphasis that needs to be continued. And so, um, what, what, the, what we learned and what worked in Washington State, and it sounds like what worked in many of the agencies that are, that are on the panel, is that we want to be informed and share. We want to have our data and share it with people and be part of a collaborative uh, force in working with Swift, Certain, and Fair. We have to engage with staff, let them own the process, have them Im impact the process. Um, that's by educating and informing champions, whether they're in your own agency or in the agencies you're collaborating with, or the people under jurisdiction, ensuring that they have a voice in the process as well. And we want to implement in a way that allows for adjustments. And in Washington State, as since we've implemented 2012, May of 2012, we've had major adjustments along the way and, and continue to do that as, as we meet here today. We want to ensure that staff accountability and compliance, we want to continue to assess impacts and make changes. 